This week's episode is sponsored by Ground News. Stay tuned to find out how, for a limited time, you can subscribe to Ground News for as little as a dollar per month or get 30% off unlimited access. Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today, I'm playing catch up with myself. My last video took a bit longer than usual to produce, and so at the beginning of the week, I was running behind. Then, on the day when I was supposed to be choosing what video to respond to and begin writing the script, one of my kids decided that they needed to test our fire extinguisher before going to school, an act that resulted in most of the main floor of my house being coated in a layer of monoammonium phosphate dust, which took several hours to clean up. So when I finally sat down to hunt for a video to respond to, I went looking for the low hanging fruit because it's easy and it's often fun as well. Today, we wound up looking at a video from the Creation Training Initiative, the organization founded by none other than the fuzzy words man himself, Michael Cornelius Riddle. This video is asking the question, when did the dinosaurs live? And we all know that a creationist organization is going to get the answer wrong, saying it was like four to six thousand years ago, or even up until the Civil War if you believe some creationists. I believe if we study history, you know, the Confederates were able to shoot pterodactyls. And yes, I do know that pterosaurs aren't dinosaurs, don't at me, it's not like Powell's likely to know the difference. Speaking of dinosaurs, I recently came across a news article about how a dinosaur bone found near an ancient human grave may have been a prized possession of one of humanity's first fossil hunters. But when reading the news, I like to make sure that I'm getting the complete picture. To that end, I use Ground News. Their mission is to shine a light on media bias and hold media accountable in a landscape where it's impossible to consult a single news source for the full picture. They offer an app and a website that lets you see how local, national, and international breaking news is covered. With a quick swipe or a simple click, you can compare articles from thousands of publications and see the ownership, bias, and factuality of those sources. You can use Ground News to get a thorough accounting of the facts and make an informed decision independent of inherent biases of the reporting outlets. I'm a longtime user of Ground News. In fact, Ground News was the very first sponsor of my channel, and I highly recommend the product. Ground News gives you a visual breakdown of the news outlets covering a particular story, making it easy to see the bias bias, factuality, and ownership of the various sources, showing that, in this case, the ancient fossil hunters were completely ignored by outlets with a right-leaning bias, with 42% of the coverage coming from the left and 58% being in the center. But we can see that 100% of the sources here have a high factuality rating, but also that 100% of them are owned by large media conglomerates. With Ground News, you can set up a personalized feed, allowing you to follow specific topics such as elections, pop culture, atheism, or any subject of interest to get notifications for breaking news. They even have a blind spot feed, where you can see which stories are not being reported on by media outlets with a right and left wing bias, which makes it easier to become a smarter news consumer by gaining a deeper understanding of the complexity and nuance of different issues by identifying media narratives. You'll also develop a well-rounded worldview and see every side of every story with access to international perspectives that can otherwise be hard to find. The web the is easy to use and the app is simple to install. Subscribe to Ground News today by going to ground.news slash vice rhino to know where your news is coming from. Subscribe through my link to get it for as little as a dollar per month or get 30% off unlimited access until December 5th. That's ground.news slash v-i-c-e-d-r-h-i-n-o for as little as a dollar per month or get 30% off unlimited access. And you'll be supporting my channel. Thank you. Anyway, let's see what Mike has to say about dinosaurs. When did dinosaurs live? The standard story taught in public schools and promoted by the media is that dinosaurs evolved into existence about 220 million years ago and died out 65 million years ago, long before man was here. Normally, the beginning of a video like this where they're pretending to be giving the secular side of things is where I can say, well, at least they know some of the correct details about the thing they're going to end up being wrong about. But this little chart actually has quite a lot wrong on it, even from the secular science perspective. So first, the time span. Yes, the non-avian dinosaurs went extinct about 65 million years ago, but dinosaurs first evolved earlier than 220 million years ago. It's hard to pin down with as much certainty as their extinction, since, you know, their evolution wasn't punctuated by a nifty little asteroid impact to make it relatively easy to figure out, but the range is generally from 250 to 230 million years ago, at least 10 million years older than what you guys are saying. Not a huge deal when working with such large time frames, but 10 million years is more than 1600 times the amount of time that creationists think the universe has existed for, so y'all are off by more than 1600 times the age of the Earth at best here. 
Second, the animal that they have at the beginning of the dinosaur time span appears to be a Dimetrodon, which predates the dinosaurs by about 20 to 40 million years, and is more closely related to humans than they are to the actual dinosaurs. And I could nitpick the fact that the 65 million years ago dinosaur appears to be a Brachiosaurus, which is a genus that went extinct about 150 million years ago, but at least sauropods existed 65 million years ago, so they're a lot closer to being correct there than they are with the 220 million year old Dimetrodon. Congrats for getting one tiny detail of your graphic almost right? The Bible teaches a different account. Yeah, well, the Bible was written by people who thought the Earth was flat, so I wouldn't take it too seriously when it comes to scientific facts. The Bible states that dinosaurs, land animals, were created on day six of creation, the same day God made man, Adam and Eve. Yep, it says that God used a magical incantation to make land animals on day six, in the same book where a talking snake convinces a woman made out of a rib to eat a fruit, the eating of which would immediately impart knowledge of right and wrong in her brain somehow, after a man who was made out of dirt named every single animal on the planet in less than 24 hours. Maybe don't take everything this book says 100% literally? The Bible also gives a very good description of a dinosaur in the book of Job chapter 40. It describes a creature called Behemoth as having a very large tree-like tail, bones like bars of iron, and as a plant eater. Okay, so we all know by now that this is going to end up with me pointing out that this is a biblical dick joke, but before we go there, can we just marvel at the vagueness of this description? Basically everything that comes before the bit talking about how much he likes to hang out in the water hiding in the reeds, like sauropods don't, is just saying, dude's big and strong. Like, unless we're going to be saying that whatever behemoth may be literally had legs made of iron with bronze tubes inside them instead of bones, why are we so focused on interpreting the tail as literally being the proportion of a full-grown tree? And as long as we're taking this literally, instead of as the string of similes it so clearly is, verse 19 says he is the first of the works of God. Last I checked, you guys believe that dinosaurs, including Behemoth, were made on day six, which was the last day God did any of his creating. Of course, the easy answer to that is that the word translated as first could also mean chief, so it's not that Behemoth was created first, it's that he's chief among all the works of God. So Behemoth is more important than humans who were made in God's image, apparently. This is not describing a hippopotamus, an elephant, or an alligator. What I find extra amusing here is that in their little graphic they've got, they've changed the hippo and elephants to give them bigger tails, which also don't look anything like trees for the record, but it's meant to point out how ridiculous it is to consider them to be the subject here, because their tails would so obviously not fit the description. But they leave the alligator's tail as is. And aside from the eating grass like an ox line, the description could very easily fit an alligator, especially when you get to the section that apologists often ignore about him lying under the lotus plants and in the shelter of the reeds and in the marsh surrounded by the willows of the brook, and confident though the river rushes against his mouth. That sounds pretty gatory to me, but I very much doubt that the authors of the Book of Job thought that alligators ate grass. Hippos, on the other hand, eat somewhere around 80 pounds of grass per day, which is a lot of fucking grass. They're known to sometimes walk 10 kilometers in a night in order to seek out this grass. And when they're not eating, they like to chill out in the water, lying under the lotus plants, sheltering in the reeds, surrounded by willows, and not bothered by the river rushing against their mouths. So the description fits a hippo about the same as an alligator if we presume that the tail like a cedar part is actually talking about the tail. The alligator has one trait wrong, the eating of grass, and the hippo has one trait wrong, the tail like a cedar. Sauropods have several things wrong. They didn't hide under lotus plants sheltering in the reeds surrounded by willows. They stayed on land most of the time. Or at least, there is no evidence of them ever swimming. It's possible, though incredibly unlikely, that some fluke of their preservation in the fossil record wiped out all the evidence from them living in an environment that is one of the most conducive to the fossilization process. More likely, though, is that they were exclusively land animals, which would explain why we only find fossil evidence of them being terrestrial. So. If we completely ignore the fact that the tail is very much a biblical dick joke, the hippo misses one of the descriptors, while sauropods miss at least five descriptors. Six if we consider the vast majority of sauropods lived before grass even evolved, and the ones that did live at the same time as grass likely did not eat grass as their primary food source. But we don't need to ignore the dick joke. It's practically being shoved down our throats. Tail is often a euphemism for penis in many cultures throughout the world, with several languages using the same word for tail and penis. 
And the description of what he's doing with his tail that comes before talking about it being like a cedar, which is translated as moves in the versions of the Bible favored by the apologists using behemoth as evidence that dinosaurs and people coexisted, can also be translated as makes stiff or extends. In fact, when counting which versions translated in that way, 20 translations say some variation of he makes his tail stiff like a cedar, and one renders it extends. Another version says the tail stands up like a cedar, giving us a total of 22 versions telling us that the thing he's doing with his tail is stiffening or extending it. Only 12 versions translated as moves, with another 5 giving us sways. So it seems that the consensus among the translators is that the tail is being stiffened, or rising, or something along those lines. And just for good measure, if we go to the pre-King James Geneva Bible translation, it actually says when he taketh pleasure his tail is like a cedar, making it the most explicit version of the dick jokes of any of the modern translations. So this verse is literally the author of Job saying he gets massive wood, not he had a really big tail. Hell, even if we consider it to be talking about the tail rather than the penis, it doesn't even say that it's as big as a tree. It moves or sways like a tree. He wags his tail like a tree blowing in the breeze. And if you've ever seen a hippo taking a shit, you know that their tails can move. It's kind of gross actually, but simultaneously impressive. And impressive is what this passage is going for, so even if it is gross, that might be what it was referring to if it's not a dick joke. But it's a dick joke. The description fits well with something like an apatosaurus dinosaur. Dude, just stick with the more generalized sauropod. If you specify apatosaurus, then I get to point out that they definitely did not eat grass, as they died out at least 50 million years before grass evolved. The titanosaur is the one where we have direct evidence of them eating grass. Also worth mentioning is that in verse 17, behemoth is described in some translations as having a navel, as in a place where a mammal's umbilical cord was attached. Though that is the minority among translations, so I'm perfectly willing to grant that point and say that the word means stomach or belly as most translations seem to do, but it is a bit of a deal breaker for the handful of King James only Christians who are usually also young earth creationists, as dinosaurs were not mammals, so they did not have navels. So if you insist on the King James Version, this verse cannot be about dinosaurs no matter what else it says. So which account is correct? For Bible-believing Christians, this is a no-brainer. And that's a problem. Because if you do decide to use your brain, you realize that this isn't actually about a dinosaur at all. So insisting that it's a no-brainer kind of gives away the game here. The Bible must be our authority in all matters. It is the Word of God. Which means your methodology is backwards. If it really is the Word of God, then you'd think it could stand up to some pretty basic scrutiny. But if you must insist on starting with the assumption that it is the Word of God in order to force it to avoid scrutiny altogether, rather than allowing it to stand on its merits, then to me, that suggests that it is not in fact the Word of God. God should not need protection from basic questioning. If you feel that he does, then you should probably re-examine why you think this God is really God in the first place. 2 Timothy 3.16 states, All scripture is inspired by God and beneficial for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness. And Ezekiel 23.20 says, There she lusted after her lovers, whose genitals were like those of donkeys, and whose emission was like that of horses. I think I'm going to use that verse to train my partner in righteousness. Likewise, John 17.17 17 states, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. That verse is literally three verses away from where Jesus prays that all of his followers would be unified in message, and not just his followers then, but all who would come to be his followers through them. Given that there are thousands of Christian denominations in the world, each with at least a slightly different message, but many with vastly contradictory messages, this itself demonstrates that Jesus was wrong. Which means that either one of the versions of Christianity that does not believe that Jesus is God is true, or Christianity as a whole is not true. But what about the scientific evidence? A note here. As Christians, we should not require scientific evidence to confirm what the Bible teaches. Another telling admission. We will believe in the Bible in spite of the evidence. If the Bible said that 2 plus 2 equals 5, I would believe it on faith, even though that is a demonstrably false statement. If somewhere within the Bible, I were to find a passage that said 2 plus 2 equals 5, I wouldn't question what I'm reading in the Bible. I would believe it, accept it as true, and then do my best to work it out and to understand it. You're not going to make new converts with this line of reasoning. To do so is elevating scientific evidence above our ultimate authority, God's Word. 
It is like saying, I can't believe what the Bible teaches unless there is scientific evidence to support it. Well, once again, I would remind you that if God's Word really is God's Word, and not just a collection of books and letters written by mere humans thousands of years ago, it wouldn't need to be artificially elevated above scientific evidence in order to avoid scrutiny and be considered authoritative. It would be able to stand up to the absolute highest levels of scrutiny that humans are capable of throwing at it. Christians should welcome such scrutiny if they were confident in the truth of the claim that the Bible is God's word. Their refusal to allow critical evaluation of the claims of the Bible is evidence not only that the Bible isn't true, but that Christians aren't even confident in the truth of the Bible. After all, as the Bible says in Luke chapter 8 verses 16 and 17, no one after lighting a lamp covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be known and come to light. The truth will out, as it were. However, it is not wrong to study and enjoy the scientific evidence because God is the creator of all things, including the principles of science. Yeah, but the problem is that the principles of science show that the Bible is wrong on a number of things, especially if you believe in young earth creationism. There are ways to make the Bible fit with science and Christian organizations dedicated to doing just that, like BioLogos, but it requires setting aside the childish beliefs in a literal interpretation of the story of Genesis. You know, like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, 11, When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. Young Earth creationists are like children, insisting that they are right despite all the evidence to the contrary, and throwing fits when people dare to question their conclusions. Put aside such childish ways. Learn to interpret things with a bit of nuance. It'll do you some good. With that in mind, let's look at what scientists have discovered about dinosaurs. 1. There are many dinosaur bones that are not fossilized. While incredibly rare, sometimes bones do not completely permineralize. And when I say incredibly rare here, I should specify it's incredibly rare for animals without exoskeletons to leave fossils that are not fully permineralized, as marine invertebrates that make shells for themselves are frequently preserved without permineralization. Also, I should clarify further, fossilization and permineralization are not the same thing, though often when people, particularly lay people, talk about fossilization, they are actually talking about permineralization. A fossil is any preserved remains, impression, or trace of an organism from a past geologic age. The current geologic age began when the Tarantian stage of the Pleistocene epoch ended about 11,700 years ago. As such, a fossil is, rather arbitrarily, any remains of an organism that are older than 11,700 years. Permineralization is one form of preservation of remains, and is the one that most people think of when they think of a fossil. In permineralization, the original material that made up the organism is replaced by minerals contained in the groundwater where the organism was buried. This can be a very quick process, happening in hours to days in some extremely specific cases. It can also be a very slow process, taking millions of years. Or it can be pretty much anywhere in between. How long it takes is entirely dependent on the local conditions. If there is very little groundwater, and that water does not have a large concentration of dissolved minerals, it will take a lot longer than if there is abundant mineral-rich water with bacterial activity speeding things along. There is nothing that says that a bone must be completely permineralized after a certain amount of time passes. Certainly, as more time passes, the chances of it not being permineralized decrease, but in some circumstances, we can get bones that are not completely permineralized. And actually, now that I've gone out of my way to explain the difference between permineralization and fossilization, let's throw another wrench into the mix. This whole time, I've actually been describing complete replacement fossils when talking about permineralization. But the reality is that most fossils are not replacement fossils, where the entire structure of the original bone is completely replaced with minerals. Most fossils are only partially replaced, with the minerals from the groundwater filling in gaps in porous bones and bonding with the original chemicals in the bone to become part of the structure, but without removing the original bone material. So looking at it this way, I take back what I said about it being incredibly rare. It turns out, still having original material in the fossil is the norm rather than the exception. Fossilization does not take long periods of time. That depends on the method of fossilization. Amber, for instance, takes a minimum of 40,000 years to fully harden. Amber that is younger than that is not amber. It's generally classified as copal and is soft and somewhat sticky when compared to fully hardened amber. It also depends on the local conditions. Like I said, permineralization can take millions of years, but in conditions that are just right, with the right bacteria present to speed things along, it can be accomplished in a matter of hours to days for a medium-sized fish. Two. 
Soft tissue has been found in many dinosaur bones. Yes, after the hard parts of the bone are dissolved away in an acid bath, microscopic amounts of what appear to be soft tissues have been found deep within the dinosaur bones. Which is the area of an organism that would be most protected from exposure by, you know, being deep within a chunky ass bone. Sorry, chunky ass bone. And contrary to what creationists will tell you, it's not unaltered blood vessels or red blood cells. It's tiny structures that resemble blood vessels and cells, but which have undergone a preservation process called crosslinking, likely catalyzed by the presence of iron from the dinosaur's blood, and further enhanced by the presence of carbonyl groups, which can not only catalyze a crosslinking reaction of their own, but they are actually a byproduct of the iron crosslinking reaction chain. And honestly, it shouldn't have come as that big of a surprise when such crosslinked molecules were discovered. It's been known since at least the 1970s that biomarkers in petroleum are highly crosslinked original molecules from the organism whose remains make up the petroleum. So it is well established that such original molecules can indeed be preserved through deep time in the right circumstances. In addition to that, in the 90s, researchers found preserved chitin proteins from the cuticles of Pleistocene arthropods, again preserved by crosslinking. Given these facts, it is completely completely unsurprising that sometimes you can find microscopic amounts of soft tissue in the most protected area of a dinosaur bone. There is no known process for preserving soft tissue for millions of years. Like I said, the preservation of organic molecules due to crosslinking has been well known since the 1970s. It just hadn't been observed in vertebrates before. 3. Proteins have been found in dinosaur bones. Ah, padding your list I see. Yes, the soft tissue discovery was the discovery of proteins in dinosaur bones. Though notably, while they are likely made of original material, their molecular structure has been changed. That's what crosslinking does, after all. So while it is morphologically identifiable as certain proteins, they are not unaltered original proteins. As soon as something dies, the proteins begin to decay. There is no known method for preserving proteins for millions of years. Maybe I'll cut them a tiny bit of slack since this video is a couple years old. Crosslinking was the hypothesized method that could have preserved the soft tissues for this long, and the iron-based crosslinking was seen as a competing hypothesis to the carbonyl group crosslinking. But neither had a detailed chemical pathway laid out. It was hypothetical. The paper that I've been referencing that did lay out a chemical framework in which this crosslinking could have happened, and showed that one type of crosslinking could lead to the other type happening simultaneously, wasn't published until May of 2023. This is an active area of research, after all. But it remains true that there were no fewer than nine papers published before this video was made that explained plausible pathways for the preservation of soft tissues, like proteins, for millions of years. And that is just conservatively counting the one cited by the 2023 paper as pertaining to these two specific pathways. If we widen our net to include any potential pathway for preservation, then we get dozens of papers going back to the 70s. So uh, yeah, the statement there is no known method for preserving proteins for millions of years is just flat out wrong. Either whoever wrote the script for this video was too lazy to do even some cursory research into the matter, or they're lying about the state of the research. 4. Portions of dinosaur DNA have been found. At the time when this video was produced, there was a grand total of one instance of suspected dinosaur DNA that had been preserved, not including the 1994 study that claimed to actually have sequenced 174 base pairs of preserved dinosaur DNA, which was later found out to be contamination of human mitochondrial DNA. In the study that was not confirmed to be contamination, they were unable to sequence the DNA in order to confirm that it was in fact dinosaur DNA, and the test that they used would not differentiate between ancient DNA and more modern contamination. They largely ruled out contamination by pointing out that it would be extremely odd for a foreign organism to only contaminate very specific sections of the preserved cell structures, and that those sections just so happened to be where the dinosaur's own DNA would have been. This does not rule out the possibility of contamination, but the results would need to be replicated using several different methods in order to confirm their findings as genuine. A study in September of 2021, which was after this video was published, found similar results using similar methods, but as far as I can tell, these two studies are the end of it. And notably, authors from both studies have stated flat out that this does not constitute finding dinosaur DNA. Mary Schweitzer, one of the authors of the 2020 study, and notably the original discoverer of dinosaur soft tissue in 2004, said, I don't think we should ever rule out getting dinosaur DNA from dinosaur fossils. We're not there yet, and maybe we won't find it, but I guarantee we won't if we don't continue to look. And 
forgive me for butchering this name, Alida Beilul, one of the authors of the 2021 study, said, These dinosaur nuclei are staining like normal cells, but does it mean that there's DNA inside them? Not really, before going on to say that their methods are a good start, but not precise enough to indicate whether certain compounds are present. So there are a grand total of two papers that could be interpreted as having found dinosaur DNA, and in both cases, authors from the papers, people who have a vested interest in their results being as exciting as possible, have flat out stated that their papers do not rise to the level of finding dinosaur DNA. Also, cross-linking was once again the proposed preservation method, so there's that. DNA has a half-life of about 520 years. The 521-year half-life comes from a single study in 2012. Notably, this study compared the DNA of leg bones of birds that died between 600 and 8,000 years ago. So even if we accept their results as universally true, we have to accept the dates for these dead birds that predate the universe by 2,000 years, according to young Earth creationists. So why do we trust data that was obtained by assuming the universe is at least 2,000 years older than you guys think it is? Would the results of their study not be massively flawed based on them incorrectly calculating the ages of the specimens they examined? But that aside, researchers in 2016 used DNA from marine sediment cores to calculate the DNA half-life, and they came up with 15,000 years, not 521. They also found that it only degraded in a manner consistent with the half-life calculation for its first 100,000 years, after which its degradation slows down and begins following a power law decay rate rather than a half-life decay rate. Given this information, we can draw two conclusions. First, DNA is not as reliable in its breakdown as radioactive isotopes. While the decay rates of various isotopes have never been observed to change outside of what can be accounted for with measurement and equipment error, DNA has been shown to have vastly different decay rates in two different environments, meaning that outside factors can influence the decay rate. And second, the decay rate of DNA is not constant. It remains approximately constant, assuming constant conditions for a certain amount of time, after which its decay rate begins slowing. So while I'm not confident in saying that we found dinosaur DNA, given these facts about how DNA decays, I see no reason to completely rule out dinosaur DNA surviving in a well-preserved fossil. All the DNA should have decayed away after about 20,000 years. Oh, that's not even right according to the 521-year half-life. The oldest expected DNA would, in that model, be about a million to a million and a half years old. 5. Red blood cells have been found in dinosaur bones. My god, this list has more padding than a fully kitted out American football player sharing a padded cell with a hockey goalie. If I'm generous, there are three things on this list, one of which was repeated a couple times. But really, considering how creationists present the soft tissue found in dinosaur bones as though the bone itself was completely made of material original to the organism it came from, all five of these items could be restated as there are many dinosaur bones that are not fossilized. So this is one item on a list restated in five different ways. There is no known method for preserving red blood cells for millions of years. Cross-linking, motherfucker! Google that shit! 6. Carbon-14 has been found in dinosaur bones. While I'm sure that creationists have pulled similar stunts as the Rape Project did for diamonds, where they send samples into legitimate labs for dating without telling them what the samples are, then reporting the minuscule amounts of carbon-14 that will always be found when something is analyzed for carbon dating, it's impossible to entirely clean their machines from previous samples, so there is always going to be some carbon-14 no matter what. And that's precisely why the measurements come with error bars. But instead of getting into when they probably did that, I'm just going to point out that contamination of dinosaur bones by modern organic material is not uncommon. In fact, in one analysis that was actually part of an effort to demonstrate that the soft tissue found in dinosaur bones was not, in fact, original to the dinosaur, they found a thriving bacterial ecosystem within the bone that they found, with 50 times the bacterial DNA within the bones than in the surrounding mudstone, and with the bacteria contaminating the area with enough carbon-14 to make you think that it was coming from a living sample. Because, you know, it was. It wasn't carbon that was original to the bone. As Potholer54 is fond of pointing out when it comes to permineralized bones, We can't carbon date this! There's no f***ing carbon in it! And in rewatching his carbon dating video in order to get that clip, I do indeed see that creationists sent dinosaur bones into a lab without telling them that they were dinosaur bones to have them carbon dated. But the bones that they sent in had been preserved with a coating of shellac and other unknown preservatives. When the lab gave them their results, they said there was insufficient carbon in the bone itself to provide a date, but they did give a date for the shellac. 
So yeah, turns out carbon is something that can easily contaminate a fossil sample, but when proper procedures are followed to avoid and rule out contamination, it turns out that there is no carbon-14 in dinosaur fossils. Any one of these evidences negates the evolutionists' claim that dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. Just a reminder that their list of six things is actually only a list of two things. Bones that are not fully permineralized have been found, and carbon-14 has been found. If you need to draw things out this much in order to make it look like you have data supporting your point, then you probably don't have data supporting your point. And indeed, when we actually examine the data that pertains to these two points, we find that neither point is valid. All six taken together discredit the story of evolution, including the idea of millions of years. Nope, it sure doesn't. At best, if absolutely everything you said is true, it would mean we'd have to reevaluate the timeline that we have for the dinosaurs. And even if it is impossible for soft tissue to last that long in dinosaur bones, that still leaves creationists with a problem. The remaining soft tissue is minuscule. If all fossils on the Earth are less than 6,000 years old, with the vast majority being less than 4,000 years old, then soft tissue should be abundant in pretty much every vertebrate fossil we find. Creationists will often point to extraordinary conditions that can happen in some circumstances to show that permineralization can happen rapidly, but they ignore that this is the exception, not the rule. It is a slow process, except for a few very specific instances. But in order for fossils to not disprove the young Earth model, we would need the fast permineralization process to be the rule and the slow ones to be the exception. But that's not what we observe in reality. So even if we take everything in this video at face value, it means that some of the non-avian dinosaurs survived the extinction event 65 million years ago, but the Earth being 6,000 years old is still impossible. So which account is correct? The one that doesn't have to artificially pad its list of supporting points to make it look like they have a better case than they actually do is probably the one that's correct. The Bible. The Word of God is always true. Even when it says that mustard seeds are the smallest of all seeds when they aren't even close? Do you just ignore the existence of orchids, sweet wormwood, common mullen, any of a hundred other plant species with smaller seeds than mustard? Was it also correct when it explained the way to breed speckled and spotted sheep was to have them mate while looking at poplar branches with white streaks peeled in them? Was it correct when it said that the moon itself is a light rather than reflecting the sun's light? Was it correct when it said that stars could fall out of the sky? Was it correct when it said in Ezekiel 18.20 that the sun shall not bear the iniquity of the father? And also correct when it said in Exodus 25 that God visits the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation? Was it correct when it said that when David defeated the king of Zobah, he had with him 7,000 horsemen in 1 Chronicles 18.4? And also correct when describing the same event in 2 Samuel 8.4, it said he took 1,700 horsemen? And I could go on. There are so many obvious errors in the Bible. Now, sure, most of them can be rationalized away with various apologetics, but if you're going to want me to trust that every word of the Bible is correct because it came to us from an all-knowing and all-powerful being, then it's not going to be convincing if a plain reading shows it to be full of errors that can only be seen as correct after doing a bunch of mental gymnastics to harmonize them. So far, you've had to misrepresent science in order to make it seem like it's wrong, and now you have to misrepresent the Bible to make it seem like it's correct. Given these two facts, I am led to the conclusion that the Bible is not, in fact, correct, and science is, in fact, trustworthy. Considerably more trustworthy than the Bible, at any rate. Dinosaurs lived at the same time as man, and true science will always agree with God's word. I'm going to go ahead and take a screenshot of this that I can post anytime someone tries to say that that meme about creationists thinking that the Flintstones was a documentary is a straw man. And while we're talking about the visuals, what's with Mike Pence running away from Triceratops up there? Dude looks like he had his left arm amputated, then grafted on next to his right arm. If this video weren't uploaded before the AI art was a thing, I would definitely have pegged that as an obvious indication of an AI fuck-up. But nope, a human being did that on purpose, presumably. In 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4, the Bible teaches, For the time will come when they will not tolerate sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. And they will turn their ears away from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. Okay, so according to biblical prophecy, we're all going to turn into Umak's obsessed Ferengi. No one has ever given me Umak's like this before. Umak's? There's no translation, but the ear is one of our most erogenous zones. 
On a less goofy note, the end of that passage is that they will turn their ears away from truth and will turn aside to myths. The Genesis creation account and the Noah's Ark story are literally myths. They are demonstrably not literally true, and they are stories that likely were never intended to be taken literally. Ancient rabbinic tradition held that when you could no longer find new meanings in a text, that text was dead. The people whose religion these stories originated in would have said that creationist insistence that the only possible meaning of the text is a plain reading of what it is saying means that the text is dead. They would likely be appalled at the creationist insistence in the absolute least interesting interpretation possible. Creationists have turned their ears away from the truth that the text was meant to convey a deeper meaning, instead turning aside to a belief in the literalness of the myths. Don't be deceived by the fancy stories from evolutionary teaching. We are to hold fast to the teachings of our Creator and Savior, Jesus Christ. Psst, psst, I got a secret for you. Listen up. Jesus never actually said anything about evolution. Not once. Never mentioned it. Acted like he wasn't even aware it was a thing. Because he, or rather the authors who wrote down what he is alleged to have said, were not aware of it. So you don't actually need to deny it on the grounds that it goes against the teachings of Jesus. In fact, the majority of Christians don't do that. So maybe stop trying to spread ignorance and lies in the name of your God? That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Max Quen 5560 who says, Once you really study science, you really have to be a fool to believe evolution. Yeah, you know what? I thought that at one point in my life too, but then I started studying science outside of what the creationists were saying about science, instead going directly to the sources that they always cite as supporting their position. And I found that, almost universally, the creationists had pulled their quote out of context in order to make it appear to be saying something that it actually wasn't saying. Which led me to wonder, if real science actually supports my position, then why do all the people that advocate for my position have to resort to such dishonest tactics in order to show support? for it, which then led to me no longer having that position. Thanks for watching! Don't forget to go to ground.news slash vicerino to get ground news for as little as a dollar per month or get 30% off unlimited access. I'll be back next Friday with more, but if you need to get your rhino fix in before then, I live stream with Cirrus every Wednesday at 8.30 Eastern on my other channel, The Watering Hole, and I stream with my partner every Tuesday at 1pm Eastern here. Thanks to Tim Robertson for being my Patreon and Sponsorships Manager, and special thanks as always to my patrons, who are the umaks to the ears that are my channel. If you'd like to lovingly and erotically caress my lobes, you have a talent for Umox. So I've been told. You can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vicerhino, or by supporting the channel in one of the other methods that can be found at links.vicerhino.com, which is also where you'll find links to my other projects. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my P.O. Box address is in the description. See you next time!